Hello and welcome to Filling the Sink, a podcast from Catalan News. My name is Leah Pileaiva, and today we're talking about international schools. This week has officially been the back to school week here in Catalonia. According to official data, 1.3 million of all Catalans have returned to classrooms, noisy schoolyards, heavy backpacks, and additionally for parents in many cases, the return of the stream of messages on parents' WhatsApp groups, or so I've heard at least. Some of these students are not enrolled in the public system, but in the ever-increasing private school sector, and in particular, the international schools. On today's podcast, we learn all about the international schools in Catalonia, what they are, who the students are, why they're gaining popularity, and much, much more. And I'm joined after a long summer break by Uriol Escudé. Welcome back, Uriol. Hello. Hi, Leah. Glad to be back. It wasn't that long for me, but yeah, we had some rest. <laughs> we did. <laughs> I'm sure many parents are happy as well to be back because they had a long summer with the kids. So I'm, I'm sure they're happy that they're all <laughs> back to school again. <laughs> I'm sure they are. And the two of us, I think uh, we can now officially say that we have become education experts because yep. this is the third podcast just this year year that we do on education here in Catalonia. Oh wow, the third already? The third. Wow. So before we dive in, let's just break down how the Catalan school system works. So education in Spain is compulsory between the ages of six and 16 years old, but you choose what school you enroll your kids into. Catalonia has two types of schools, public and private. Public ones are fully state funded with free tuition and secular. They follow the local curriculum. And private schools, on the other side, are privately owned and managed and may or may not be secular. They are purely private and do not receive any government subsidies, so the cost of schooling is covered by families. But there is a third type of schools, the concertadas. Okay, and that is kind of in between the public and the private school system. Yeah, you could say they are semi-private or semi-public. They receive subsidies that cover the cost of basic educational needs, but families pay a contribution to cover the costs of running the school. The amount that parents are expected to contribute changes from school to school, but it's around 100 or 500 euros per month. And concertadas also follow the local curriculum. All right. And then the international schools, what exactly are they? Well, there are different definitions and the line between what is and what's not an international school is a bit blurry. Some say international schools are those schools where the language of instruction is different from the country they're based. And some others say the curriculum needs to be different as well. So that's the definition we are considering. For example, in Catalonia, it would be a school where English is the language of instruction and they follow the British curriculum, the IB, the USA curriculum, France, Switzerland. So different curriculum and different language from Catalan or Spanish. Mm -hmm. But just to clarify, international schools by default are private, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the best schools in Spain are here in Barcelona. Yeah, a recent ranking by Forbes listing the 100 best schools in Spain put three international schools in Catalonia in the top 10. Wow. In fact, considering public-private concertadas all the schools, the best school in Spain, according to this ranking, is the Agra School in San Esteve Sesrovires, which is near Barcelona. Then we have another Agra International School in the top five. This one is in San Cugat, near Barcelona as well. And in the ninth spot, we have the American School of Barcelona, which is in Splugas de Llobregat. Okay, and you mentioned before that these international schools, they follow different curriculums. What are the most common ones here in Catalonia? Well, again, there's no official data on how many schools, how many curriculums, how many students, but listed in the international schools database, it says that IB is the most common curriculum, followed by the British, and then the Spanish or Catalan, and the American. Okay, and you said IB. What does that stand for? IB stands for International Baccalaureate. It is an academic program, and it's regarded for its good quality. It's an international qualification with a worldwide standardized curriculum, which means you can transfer from one school in one country to another 
with few academic problems. And that's why it's so popular among international students. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that if people come to stay in one country for just a couple of years, then this would be a great option if then they were to return home or move to a different country afterward. Yeah, exactly. Okay, international schools means also different languages. Yeah, and it's one of the main reasons why parents want to enroll their kids in this type of schools. The language of instruction depends on the school. For those following international curriculums, English is usually the most popular language, and then they offer multiple options, French, German, Mandarin, Russian. But then there are other schools using French, for example, or German as the language of instruction. And then uh, we can see the role of Catalan and Spanish differs from school to school. Those purely international, it probably has a less important role. But for those schools following local curriculums, it has a bigger importance. So, yeah, it depends a bit on the school. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about the role of the languages later on in the podcast. And now the students who study at the international schools, I think it's very easy to think, well, it's only international students, people who come to stay here for a couple of years. But do we actually know anything about the nationalities of the students? Yeah, again, there's no official data on that number, but we can find that in the websites of the schools. We've seen that more or less the ratios are around 50-50, mm -hmm. but it's different from one school to another. For example, the American School of Barcelona, it says that it has approximately 25% of their students from North America, 30% from Spain, and 45% from other countries. The British school, for example, it has 36% of locals. But then on the other side, the Agora school we mentioned, the one in San Cugat, has 80% of local students wow. and only 20% international. Uh, so it, it's a completely different story looking at different schools. But yet there's definitely a big number of locals as well in these schools, even though you would expect it would be only an international thing. Okay, so I think a lot of people are now wondering this next thing, the fees. How much does it cost to send your child to an international school? Yeah, international schools are definitely very expensive. They can go from 3,000, that's the cheapest, a year per children, to 30,000 a year. Wow. And you spoke to education consultant Anja van der Drift, and she explained a lot more about this. I started my Barcelona school around five years ago and my Barcelona school is a service for families who are looking for schools in and around Barcelona. My motivation for starting it was just realizing how important it was for my family to find a good fit for my children and how that can really influence whether you end up as a foreigner, whether you end up staying or not. So Anya, what type of families do you usually work with? The kinds of families that come to me tend to be the ones who aren't so sure which direction they want to go. So there may be families who they're coming from abroad, they're arriving in Barcelona, and perhaps they're looking for something that is similar to what they've come from before. So for example, if they're looking, if they're in the British system, they're potentially looking for a school that follows the British curriculum. And often, People are choosing international schools here for the language as well. They would like their child, for example, immersed in English. So an international school will give them that. Right, I see. And what's the difference between those who plan to stay here for a long time and those who know they'll be living in a few years? Many families that move here are very, especially if they have the intention of staying here long term, they are interested in the local system. So I work with a number of families who Maybe they, they were here without kids first, and then they have a child, and then they have a sense, well, well, we would like to bring our child up here. Actually, the local system makes most sense because we want them to learn Catalan, we want them to learn Spanish and English, but you know, we understand that Catalan is an important language here, so we're gonna, we're gonna follow the local curriculum. And for those who know they will not be here for long, I guess international schools make more sense, right? Yes, of course, there are families that they know that within a couple of years they're going to move on to another country because, you know, one of the parents has to, uh, you know, that, that's the 
you know, what their lives are like, that they move from place to place. And yes, obviously for a family like that, it makes more sense to go into an international education because they have uh, consistency. And what about the admission process? Is it difficult to get into an international school? It really depends on the school. Um, I think language is an important component of admission or no admission. So, for example, if you have a three-year-old and they're not, a na for example, a native English speaker and they would like, you know, their parents would like them to enter into an English-speaking program even if they don't speak that language at home, it's much more easy for a child of that age to enter into a, an international school at that age. If you're talking about a 12 or 13 year old where the family doesn't speak English at home, but they want to enter into an English speaking program, an inter English speaking international school, that becomes a lot harder. So that is one of an important criteria that uh, international schools are looking at, depending on what the main language of the school is. Yes, they can be con competitive. Um, some schools have a very, uh, a very intensive application process so there will be lots of expectations from the family to provide reports entry tests personal interviews other other schools are much more relaxed about it um, they may ask for a, a language test they will all schools will ask for reports from a previous school and if you could give one piece of advice to families what would it be If you were looking for your child entering in September 2025, a good idea to start looking would be to start looking around the autumn, the fall of the year before, just because it gives you a lot of time to research the schools, visit the schools if possible. Thanks to Anya for speaking with us. So one thing that you talked about with Anya was this increase in the number of international schools. Yep, there's been a huge increase in international schools, but we couldn't prove that using government data because the education department doesn't have data on that, or at least, or at least they haven't provided it to us. So we reached out to ISC Research. It's an organization that analyzes the international schools market, and they've told us that there are 48 international schools in Catalonia, mm -hmm. right? 31 of them are in Barcelona city, wow. just the city, and this number has doubled in 10 years. Wow. Okay, so 10 years ago, there were around 15 international schools in Barcelona, and now it's 31. Yeah. So is this increase just a Barcelona thing? No, it, it has increased a lot in Spain as a whole as well, by 62% in a decade. Mm-hmm but in Barcelona has doubled. So the increase is bigger here. And there are a few reasons behind this. Uh, first, Catalonia is becoming a growing expatriate community, especially Barcelona, of course. It has become a magnet for expats, professionals with, with high income, with quality jobs. And they come here, you know, for the quality of life, the climate, the business opportunities. And there are many big companies setting up operations here in Barcelona, which leads to a big number of foreigners with good jobs coming here to work. Although there's no exact data on this because it's difficult to define who is an expat and who's not. Yeah. And it's even difficult to define what's an expat, exactly. right? But it's calculated around 10% of Barcelona's population comes from a country with a higher GDP than ours. So we could say that 10% of Barcelona's population has an international background and they are potential clients for international schools. Uh -huh, okay. And it's kind of interesting because on a Spanish level, Madrid was always the city with more international schools because it had a more established diplomatic community that had a higher demand for international schools. But now that's no longer the case. Yeah, and that's why the increase in international schools in Barcelona is so remarkable, because it's almost overtaking Madrid. Yeah, it is quite remarkable. But even though it's a relatively new phenomenon, this increase in international schools, international schools in Catalonia and in Barcelona, they have a long history. And you caught up with postdoctoral researcher Andreas Uñol, who has been observing international schools for a number of years. So let's hear about her findings. International schools are nothing new. 
although the increase in the number of these schools in Barcelona is mainly due to the large influx of professionals with higher salaries moving there, there are still many locals who choose these schools for their children. Andrea Suñol, who wrote her doctoral thesis on the subject, explains how international schools have grown. The number of international schools clearly increased after the 2008 financial crisis, when young people's futures were compromised and middle classes with this concern and pressure to keep up the social class tried to do what they could to ensure that their children would continue to maintain the social status that they acquired. And one way of doing this was through education. They thought speaking English would open doors for their children to get jobs and move abroad. Then a number of private schools started teaching more English than the rest. And after 2008, they became international schools. It was a way to differentiate themselves from other schools in the market. In fact, many of today's international schools were originally founded as Catalan schools. The education system works like a market, adapting to the ideas and feelings of each era. In the 80s, these schools were offering education from a strong Catalan perspective. This was after the Franco dictatorship, a time of coming together as a country. There was the feeling of building something new. Many of these schools were founded by families and parents' associations. Andrea studied two schools, one a classical and purely international school, and the other a Catalan private school that had been converted into an international school. The purely international school had very little to do with the place it was located in. Everyone spoke English, everything was in English. In that school, you could be in another part of the world. In the other school, there was a lot of tension. Even though the school is international, it ended up being run like a local private school. The teachers were local and spoke Catalan, and the local curriculum dominated. Some of the international families found that the number of international students was very low, and they felt out of place, even scammed. Whether they follow the local or a foreign curriculum, one thing they all have in common, a more individualized approach to education. International schools project the idea that students must become and achieve certain things, promoting the vision of a highly competitive individual. There is a clear intention to steer them toward a particular way of being and engaging with society, which is, you are the leaders of the future and you must be this way in order to lead the world that is coming. Thanks to Andrea Suñol for speaking with us. Okay, so we have now been talking about the increase in international schools in Catalonia and in Barcelona. But are the international schools actually better than public schools, Uriol? Yeah, so they definitely are better. We have looked at the latest PISA results. The PISA are these international tests that are conducted every three years. One of the education podcasts that we did back in January, right? Yeah, exactly, because it was a big thing. And it still is. It caught so many headlines because of the alarming results. What were they? So basically, Catalonia got their worst results ever. And here, if we look at the difference between how public and how private schools did, uh, the difference are huge. So, so for example, if we look at the average in the EU, we can see that the difference is big. So private schools performed overall much better than public schools. The difference is of 21 points. Now, that doesn't mean much, but I'll explain that later. In Spain, mm -hmm. the difference between private and public schools is even bigger. And in Catalonia, it gets even bigger and it reaches 37 points. Why the points are important. So the OECD says that 40 points means one academic year. So if you're 37 points behind, it means literally that those in public schools are one year behind those in private schools. Wow, that's super alarming. Yeah, that's huge. The difference between private and public schools in Catalonia is one of the worst in the European Union. I think that's really staggering a whole year of difference between the private and the public schools. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to learn more, make sure to check that podcast we did back in January because we spoke about this crisis that the public education in Catalonia is undergoing with experts and, and it was great stuff. So have a listen. 
And obviously, apart from these better results that the international schools have, one of the things that really attracts parents to private schools are the facilities. So just uh, anecdotally, I went a year ago to the opening of the new campus of the British School in Barcelona. And this campus was literally one of the most beautiful campuses I've ever seen. I wanted to go there <laughs> and I haven't gone to school for years and years. But again, when looking at these bad results of public schools compared to private schools, let's remember the ones are free and the other ones have very high tuition fees, right? Yeah, so they have like great facilities. They can have all the newest equipment exactly. and that can also motivate the children, obviously, to learn in a different, more innovative way. And you have better student-teacher ratios, so smaller class sizes, as well you have more extracurricular activities, which is something that attracts many parents because, of course, it helps the development of the child. So looking at this overall picture, it is obvious that one's are better than the others in terms of results. Yeah, and I think also what we have to also consider when we talk about better results is that international schools have admissions tests and they get to choose the students that they want to have, whereas in public schools they have to accept everyone. This is obviously not to make excuses, and I think it's always great if they want to improve the public system, but I think that the results of PISA, they shouldn't stand on their own, but they need a broad broader context. And now having been talking about international schools, one thing that I'm wondering, is there any repercussion of the growth of international schools? Well, really, there aren't any repercussions, because if you look at the numbers, the number of people going into private and international schools, it's still very little. Private schools account only for 2% of the overall schools in Catalonia. So the vast majority of students go to public or concertadas, mm. mostly public schools. So repercussions, not really, because this increase in international schools is still very little if you look at the whole picture. For sure. But some experts argue that going to an international school can create a social disconnection from the local culture, from reality, because you remain in this bubble where one language, which is not the local languages, is spoken. So you don't have that contact with reality, with society, and you don't need to be part of society to exist because you have a school where that is provided. So you could live in any part of the world, really, uh, and not have that connection with the local culture. That as well depends on parents, on families. It's not the school's fault. <laughs> of course. And then the counter argument is that it can help students to become better at languages. It can open many doors. And then, of course, it can also be a great alternative for a family that only has relocated to another country for a short while. And it's time now for the Catalan phrase of the week. Uriel, what have you found this week? It's been an easy one, especially after holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and we've picked Pusarsa las pilas. Pusarsa las pilas, so to put in the batteries? <laughs> yeah, exactly, literally <laughs> that. In English, the equivalent would be to get down to business, or if you've been slacking off a bit, it would mean to pull your socks up. <laughs> It's to work with more energy or efficiency, to become more active, getting energized, starting to work, basically. Okay, so pusarse las pilas is something that we all have to do this September, <laughs> right after getting back from vacation. And that's all we have time for today. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe to Filling the Sink wherever you get your podcast if you haven't already. And thanks to everyone for speaking with us. Thanks again to you, Uriol. My pleasure. And we'll be back again next week with another episode of Filling the Sink. On behalf of the team here at Catalan News, I'm Leah Bilaiva, wishing you a great weekend. Fins aviat. Adeu. Adeu.